Division. This is the first time we're covering Joy Division. In the opening montage, uh, for, this is their album, Unknown Pleasures, uh, you heard a clip from She's Lost Control, and now you're going to hear a clip from New Dawn Fades. Comes in at number um, eight in the 1970s on Best Ever Albums, cracking the top ten, number three in 1979, number 35 wow. of all time. And uh, it did make Rolling Stone's list, although not as high. It's uh, number 211 for Rolling Stone. Um, and this is uh, Joy Division's highest rated album. Um, they've actually only have two proper albums, so uh, yep. so they don't have a whole lot. I think we're going to cover the other one in the 80s, too, so we're going to get all the Joy Division. Um, so this record was recorded in April of 1979 and released on June 15th, 1975. It is their debut album. There were no singles from this record, and the album did not chart, so um, it, did, it did not sell well, but it was overall well-received by critics. Uh, the band consists of Ian Curtis on vocals, Bernard Sumner on guitars and keyboards, Peter Hook on bass, and Stephen Morris on drums. And a little history on the band, they were formed in Salford, England in 1976 by Bernard Sumner and Peter Hook, who were uh, childhood friends. And they were inspired to start a band after they both saw a Sex Pistols concert. Um, but they didn't go to the show together. They just ended up being at the show and later on were like, noticed that they were there. And they were said, hey, we should start a band. So the next day, Hook borrows 35 pounds from his mom and he buys a bass. And uh, they begin with the two of them. They, they get a drummer by the name of Terry Morrison to join. I'm sorry, Terry Mason, excuse me. And... They then did one of John's favorite things, which was placing an ad in the Manchester Virgin <laughs> Record Shop to, uh, to solicit a lead singer. And that Spoiler was alert, that's how you guys are getting replaced one day, basically. <laughs> Just... <laughs> John's going to place an ad and yeah. Uh, and whatever version of the Virgin Record Shop we have today. <laughs> We're going to have some sort of argument in which we go a different way, and I'm going to carry on the name of the podcast, but it's going to be a shell of our old <laughs> version. Yeah. You have so, to yeah. twi wouldn't Twitter would be the modern day version of that, wouldn't it? I mean, it would have to be like because nobody's I, posting ads. You could do it on the, the grocery uh, store corkboard. The grocery yeah. store. <laughs> I think I think the last thing that could possibly have done it was like when MySpace was around. I could see a because there were bands that formed in my. I don't even know how you do it now because yeah. people don't really like. I guess people post their own music, you know, and get discovered mm -hmm. that way. But right. I think yeah. Yeah. So anyway, Ian Curtis responds to this ad, and he actually knew the other other members of the band, and um, they just offered him a spot without an audition. And later, Sumner said um, that he knew that he quote knew he was all right to get on with, and that's what we based the whole group on. If we liked someone, they were in. So there you go. <laughs> well, yeah, fair enough. Good. Yeah, yeah, good, good in some respects. <laughs> uh, oddly enough, I think I'm pretty sure that uh, Sumner and Hook hate each other now, like hmm. like really bad. <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> So the band originally called themselves Warsaw, which was inspired by the David Bowie song Warsaw, oh, Warsaw yeah, so from nice. the 1977 Low. album Low, oh. correct? Um, and the band Warsaw debuted on May 29th, 1977 in support of three other bands, including the Buzzcocks. Hmm. So they got immediate, pretty much positive reviews, and they started making, uh, starting getting some national exposure pretty early on. Um, and the drummer, Terry Mason, actually ends up becoming the manager. And they bring on another guy by the name of Steve Steve Brotherdale to play the drums. Oh, he, and, he just said, I'm going to be the manager instead. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of just a throwaway line. That says, okay, so then Mason became a manager. So, uh, so we get this other guy to play drums. Um, and then they record a demo in July of 77. And uh, this is this is an all-time uh, gangster move of, of kicking somebody out of a band. So they're not really happy with Brother Dale as in general, particularly his aggressive personality. And so they fire they fire him soon after the, the, the demo session was recorded. And they did this during a drive home from the studio. And they pulled over and asked Brother Dale to check on a flat tire. When he gets out of the car, they drove off. So, oh, my uh, God. <laughs> wow. Yep. Pretty, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, in August, they put up another ad in a music shop for a drummer. And this time, it was only answered by one person, which was Stephen Morris. And uh, he actually also knew, knew Ian Curtis from school. So that was another, uh, you know, a friend that, that, that some, at least somebody knew. So he joins the band, and that rounds out the, uh, the, the foursome that basically um, is the band for the remainder of their, uh, of their duration. Uh, but they had to change their name because there was another band in London called Warsaw Pact. 
P-A-K-T, and they didn't want to be confused with them. So they named, they changed their name to Joy Division in early 1978. And this is one of the most, I was sad when I learned about this because I didn't know what Joy Division, where it came from or what it meant. Do either oh, of you? Oh, yeah. Oh, I do. No, this is, I wasn't it like, a, it was like a Nazi thing, wasn't it? Yeah. Like the uh, the women, the <laughs> prostitutes, or the women, right? Yes. Like kind of like a, the Jap- Japanese comfort thing women right but like yep. in nazi yeah okay yeah it was the sexual slavery wing of a nazi concentration yes. camp um, mentioned go. in mentioned oh. in the 1955 novel house of dolls but that's actually what it was and that's 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 another thing that i just realized that like sometimes i'm just oblivious <laughs> and stupid to things like i obviously aware of the holocaust and stuff i had never thought of anything about sexual slavery of course the nazi was, would have done stuff stuff like that yeah but i never even thought of that so that idea just stuck in my head and i was yeah, I was like, geez, that's a messed up thing, and they're going to name their band after that. So, yeah, there you well, go. Their lyrics well, and music match it. <laughs> I was about to say, there were some other references of it inside of it. So, yeah. Yeah. So, um, anyway, so in April of 78, they catch the attention of a music producer, Tony Wilson, as well as a manager, Rob Gretton. And Gretton convinces the band to take him on as manager. So out goes the original drummer. Um, and he's got a relentless work ethics and is credited to much of the band's uh, success. And in June of 78, they did release their debut EP, which was called An Ideal for Living. And there's more Nazi uh, symbolism here because on the picture of that, the cover of that album features a drawing of a young Hitler youth member. Um, And that coupled with the band's name, it fueled speculation about their political affiliations. um, And they were, (laughs) while they were were somewhat intrigued by fascism at the the time, that uh, Morris, the drummer, believes that their, uh, you know, their dally, their, their, you know, uh, ex- exploration into Nazi imagery came from a desire to keep the memories in this, of the sacrifices of their parents and grandparents during World War II alive. Mm-hmm. And he argued that the accusations of neo-Nazi sympathies, quote, merely provoked the band to keep on doing it because that's the kind of th- people we are. <laughs> so, uh, that seem- so, yeah, yeah. that seems kind of like some of the bands in New York at the punk rock. They've started wearing like Nazi stuff on their clothes and things just to be provocative. And yeah. Yep. Um, so they make their, they made a television debut in September of that year. And then in December, Ian Curtis suffers a severe epileptic seizure on the way home from a gig. And uh, he had to be hospitalized for that, but that was kind of the beginning of um, a, a number of seizures that, that Ian Curtis would have throughout the duration of his life, um, which would just add to his, uh, you know, the, the, the issues that he had, um, the personal issues that he had as well. And so for this record, they bring in a producer by the name of Martin Hannett to work on the album. Uh, he wasn't, uh, and Hannett wasn't a fan of the minimalist production of many punk records. Um, and for, for this album, he wanted to use a number of different techniques and sound effects, which are, are, are many. And there's, there's a list here, there's things called the AMS 1580s digital delays, the Marshall time modulators, tape echoes, as well as the sound of bottle smashing, someone eating crisps, backwards guitar, and the sound of Strawberry Studios lift with a Leslie speaker whir, uh, whirring inside and, the, and the, uh, the sound of a basement toilet. So he's just using all kinds of sound effects in this. Um, he, he later said that the band was a dream to work with because they didn't know, the band didn't know what they were doing <laughs> in the recording studio. So they basically just agreed to whatever Hannett would suggest. So uh, there weren't a whole lot of arguments. Um, but Hannett actually has a huge part in the overall sound of, uh, of Joy Division and um, is credited with being just a- as important to this record as the band members themselves. Um, and all music writes that Hannah's productions on unknown pleasures was as much a hallmark as the music itself, describing it as emphasizing space in the most revelatory way since the dawn of dub. And uh, Hook and Sumner were not fans of the production when it first came out. They felt that it was changing their sound. It was a very different hmm. sound than what their live performances were. Um, a lot of their live performance was very energetic, a lot of guitar, but uh, the production here had toned down the sound. And uh, Hook complained that they sounded too much like Pink Floyd. Um, Morris and Curtis, however, like <laughs> that's, yeah, that's every every band that thinks of themselves as you know like counterculture and stuff. It's like oh, I want to sound like Pink Floyd. That yeah. seems to be like the yeah, especially in Britain. It's sort of like is the shorthand. Yeah, so they're the punching bag. Genesis sure. is the other one that no one wants to sound like. They get ragged on a lot too, and in, in stuff I read. So, yeah, well. Mm-hmm. 
I disagree. But anyway. <laughs> well, no, I'm um, just saying they, they represent something. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know what it yeah, is. There's something, but like, yeah, it's there's something cool. about those two bands in Britain yeah. that rep. I don't know if it's not cool as much as the minimalist, right, folks? It's like, yeah. like they view like Genesis and yeah, yeah, Pink Floyd as like. Or prog rock in general, really, right? Like, yeah. it's just the overdone. Yeah. Um, Morris and Curtis did like the production, actually. So. Um, uh, but later on, you know, Peter uh, you know, Hook, uh, you know, agreed that the production was actually pretty good in 2006, that he it definitely didn't turn out sounding the way I wanted it. But I, I can now see that Martin did a good job on it. There's no two ways about it. Martin Hannett created the Joy Division sound. So um, so he's pretty important here. The cover is also pretty famous. Um, it was designed by a guy named Peter Seville, and it's based on radio waves from Pulsar 1919. Mm whatever I was wondering is. yeah it's some radio waves that he had he created Space. um they were that's rest- the first pulsar ever I think that was photographed oh is it I actually, think I, that's what it I, is I, I, I did look this up I actually thought that we might have to do something remember with that way early on we did the birds album and they had some sort of song about uh, some space <laughs> some space thing oh well yeah Josh not liking it too much I didn't know if it was yeah. the same thing but it's not um <laughs> so uh the sales were very slow on this re- on this record um but then there was a non-album single called Transmission, which was released in November of 79. And um, once that was released, they sold out of the original pressing, which was somewhere around ten to 15,000 copies. Hmm. But it was reissued on July of 1980, and it reached number 71 uh, the next month. And then for the 40th anniversary, uh, there was a reissue of the album, um, in, which was in 2019. And at that point, it reached number five on the UK charts, making it their highest charting album. But taking it 40 years after its release so um so we'll cover them again in the 80s but um yeah so let's let's go what our takes here josh what do you think of the uh, unknown pleasures here well we've we've got a contender for the most depressing album of the decade that's uh that's saying something you know between nick drake's albums and the berlin album mm-hmm. of lou reed i mean that's up here i mean this this album just seems so dark in sound and feeling yeah it's amazing how uh, that quality kind of pick i picked up on that almost right away just hearing the music the music sounds so not sludgy but it's like slow it's like echoey it's mm-hmm. like you're in a tunnel or a well at times and um it's sad too it's they're like i don't know this is like depression per in the musical form almost in some ways it's uh it's and it just sounds so different too I, I couldn't think of another album that we've talked about that sounds like this i mean i think there's things that are somewhat similar but it is kind of its own thing the the drums are up front a lot the, the bass sounds up front as well or the guitar is like toned really down so it sounds like a bass on some way and it's very um the album itself is like very melodic and kind of just like repeating repeating guitar uh, sound throughout the whole album on many of the different sounds throughout each song but it's it's kind of i don't know not repetitive in a bad way but uh, i don't know melodic or hypnotic in some sort of Mm. some way um I definitely paid attention to the lyrics uh, on this album. There's a things like on insight, which is about in the middle of the album. He says, I I don't care anymore. I've lost the will to want more. And then on new dawn fades, they say, I took the blame directionless. So plain to see a loaded gun won't set you free. So they say, so you say, and it's, it sounds very personal. This album, um, although they've, on an album or a song like she's lost control they kind of put it on somebody else or a story about someone else and i guess it also kind of sounds like black sabbath in a way it's it's metal it's a metal sounding album in a, in a sense and that's kind of slow deliberate type of pacing to it hmm. um the uh yeah it's <laughs> It's hard to say it was enjoyable. It was definitely listenable, you know, kind of different in the way that we've talked about some of those cold listen albums that were very hard to get through. I wouldn't say that this was something I listened to all of the time, but I did appreciate it. And I can kind of see so many 
influences coming from Joy Division also. It's uh it it's singular in in a way, but it's also like for a certain type of person and a certain type of mood um or a combination of those. It's uh you know it's emo in a way in in that respect too. It's it, it's emotional but in a kind of expressionless sort of way <laughs> it's kind of contradictory i guess but yeah interesting album i wouldn't say i loved it but i didn't definitely didn't hate it either yeah i, I have a little bit different take than you on this one just because I, I like this album a lot hmm, um okay. i i think it it's singular only in the sense that it there's n- it's there's not a lot in the 70s which is doing this but boy is there a lot in the 80s and 90s that's doing this and that's the first thing that comes to mind for me is boy this sound is the sound that begat like a lot of synth pop in the 80s that icy synth pop Mm -hmm. a lot of like house and industrial even bands in like the 2000s like the kaiser chiefs and franz ferdinand i mean those bands you know the parts and elements of them even a little bit of you know, they pop it up a little bit, but the sort of the nihilism at times in their lyrics is there. Um, I remember way back when, when we did There's a Riot going on, right, by Sly mm-hmm. and the Family Stone, a review I read said, um, this is, the scary thing about this album is that it takes, you know, doing drugs, right, and makes it like seductive in a way that you want to be part of it, even though you shouldn't, right? Like there's an ominousness, but you still mm-hmm. get invited in it. And I feel like that's where this is with like depression and sort of isolation and like a nihilistic feel. Because while this album is very cold and industrial, it's not uninviting either, which is the interesting yeah. thing about it. It's got like that kraut rock thing with the metronomic, um, sounds at times and repetition the electronic drums are in this um there's also a lot of space and i'm glad that that was mentioned in the bio because there's a there's a lot of space in this album like in between that you can project stuff into Mm -hmm. um and it's interesting because it's a tight album but it's a tight album where the space is built into the tightness which almost sounds oxymoronic but um so in that way it feels a lot like like uh like can and craft work at times because of um, that that element of it. It's certainly post punk as well. It fits nicely yeah. in the late seventies for sure. And of the time, like that's absolutely why I think you know, even though it sounds different than say the Buzzcocks or um, you know the Sex Pistols of the early punk or the Clash, it, it definitely we're getting into that post punk now, which is. Sort of like what I was listening to that Wire album I talked about. Certainly the Public Image Limited stuff. Um, we're getting into that more industrial sound, the synthetic sound. Um, I but I really like this album. There's just something about this album that that called me in. While I couldn't directly the the sort of the um, the relentlessness of the bleak outlook is not something that I relate to personally. But there's bits and pieces of that feeling that you can throw yourself into at any different song and kind of um, like get in. And like Josh said, like in the right mood, like it would connect quite a bit. Uh, But my, my big takeaway from this was um, how ahead of the, ahead of its time to some degree it was and how much of a temp, how much of a template for like the eighties and parts of the night, like certainly the eighties joy division was because I mean, maybe like as we go on the journey, guys, like, I, you know, I'll call back to it and say, hey, are you hearing it? But everything from new, you know, new romantic to synth pop. I mean, these guys, literally everybody but Ian Curtis, right, becomes new order, yeah. if I remember yeah. correctly. Right. Yes. And new, mm-hmm. I mean, new order certainly has a lot and they have a sort of uh, uh, a, a very industrial feel to them as well. And And when you think about like what's coming down the pike for us, right, with you know, Depeche Mode and New Order, like we said, Soft Cell and stuff like that. Um, this really is the beginning of that. Even even Goth, which we haven't talked about, by oh, the yeah, way. That's a good... There's a lot of there's a lot of early Cure sound in this album as well. Oh yeah. Like if you listen to the first couple of Cure albums, that that's a cousin to this, and certainly the the grim tones and you know speaking candidly about your mental health. Um, 
in the the placement of she's lost control in the middle of this album is such an interesting placement um because it really does serve as like the bellwether of the album like stuck right in the middle and uh i as i was hearing that song i knew a little bit about ian curtis's um, epilepsy and so even though he's singing about it about a female i was curious i was like is this a proxy and turns out that he i guess he worked at an employment agency Mm -hmm. and there was a woman that would come in right around the time he was realizing about epilepsy right this woman had epilepsy and a couple times she had like epileptic fits right or seizures while he was there and he's not thinking much of it because she stops coming in so he thinks she um must have gotten a a, a job, right? And he finds out later, no, actually, unfortunately, she had an epileptic seizure in her sleep and choked to death. And that's what that song's about, like that feeling of not having control. And, and it kind of led to kind of a bleak story where Ian Curtis and his wife would stay up at night so that Ian Curtis could have the seizure or come close to it so that he wouldn't have to worry about it coming when he was asleep. Mm-hmm. Um, and just when you, you hear it in that context, um, like it really does, you know, it's like that thing where you step out, but it's really about you. And to some degree, it adds layers to it. Like when you're watching your own narrative, but through someone else, like it's particularly, I think, jarring. And yeah, I mean, you're not going to necessarily feel good after this album at all. But I think it's, um, I think to write it off though, and, and so I feel like to some degree, it's a dis, it's a disservice to Joy Division that they're kind of like, well, uh, there's that band, and then Ian Curtis died at like 22 or 23 years old, right? And then they ended, and then they became New Order. But um, there's more to them than that, you know? And unfortunately, I think they're always going to sort of be short-sketched in that. But um, I think my takeaway from this is how much, as an album to finish the 70s, how fitting this album was, because th- this is the 80s yeah. coming at us. It really is. That That's my last takeaway. Like, boy... You can't see the 80s coming in any album we've listened to more than this album, I would say. Yeah, I'm I'm with you on this, John. I love this record. Um, I thought this was a really fantastic way to end as well. This is not that we haven't heard anything like this up until this point. Um, This absolutely does not sound like a 70s record. This sounds like so much of the music that I, you know, um, got into when I was in college and started listening, you know, more of the indie rock and stuff that, that I listened to in the 2000s, even stuff today. Um, this is this is like groundbreaking stuff that just laid the path for so much of the music that I really, you know, really like the kind of that 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 somber tone. Um, I, I again, I, I'm not paying it to I, obviously I knew that the lyrics were sad and stuff like that, but I didn't pay again, I'm not paying too much attention to what's being said, but just the 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 um how much this sounds like like a lot of the bands that you said like the cure then this is what i always remembered was interpol was always a band that was kind of said well they're trying oh to yeah Division, that's a great you know? yeah like that's, that's a great and mm-hmm. and that's and you absolutely hear i don't know the interpol lead singer's voice but he's definitely channeling ian curtis on when on his vocal styles and i love that band and i love a lot of the stuff that that they have done and other bands like them um, paul banks right is that his name yeah Interpol's that sounds right singer? paul yeah. banks yep and um but there's but you know, under with 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 all the uh, you know the sad nature of this, the press, depressing nature of the sound here, you, there's still some really great melodies. This is there's right. parts of this album that are very danceable. This is like yeah. this upbeat dance. The bass is so great in yeah. this, like just the bass lines that he's playing, and then in a song like um, "New Dawn Fades," mm-hmm. how the bass is kind of like going. Um, it's like a downward it's a descending kind of uh, melodic piece that he's playing. And then the guitar comes in and it kind of goes ascending. And the way that the two of those play in together is just so freaking good. And I didn't realize this, but um, I, I, I found this interesting. Uh, Moby did a remix of this back in like the mid nineties. And it was actually used in the film heat, which was this, the scene where um, Al Pacino is following yes. uh, Robert yes, De Niro was. in yep. the car. Oh. And it's like, it sound it's sound, And I always remember really like, I'm like, that's such a cool sounding song. And it's freaking it's, it's new dawn fades just mm-hmm. like done much more of a, in a Moby type way, I guess you could say. So I thought that that was an interesting um, piece of uh, trivia, but it starts off great. Disorder is a great opening track, just very mm-hmm. upbeat. And I kind of, there's a lot of like, oh, and this channels not only what's happening, what's going to kind of happen in the eighties and nineties and beyond, but this is also very much rooted in some parts in like fifties and sixties kind of like, you know, um, rock and roll as well. Um, those Phil you know, Spector drums. 
like the Phil a Spector times. drums, yeah, like the echoey drums, and just but just like the kind of you just listen to that that bass line in disorder, you could you could see that being kind of like a bouncy '60s type melody that's mm. happening there, and. Um, I just I think the production is great. I think it's really interesting that the band was, you know, half the members of the band were upset with the way that the album sounded because it wasn't like like, you know, what they played live. Um, but it's it, but they've 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 later on credited him with just saying that that's that's the reason we sounded that way is because of the, the producer. So it's interesting that a producer can make can be that influential in the overall sound of a band. Um, so I thought that that story was kind of interesting as well. So. Um, but then there's songs like later towards the end, stuff like Wilder, uh, Wilderness and Ender Zone that are kind of more, they're they're a little bit more, uh, I would say maybe upbeat rock songs. They're kind of a little bit more traditional rock songs, more um, guitars that are kind of um, being strummed rather than like the staccato nature, because that's another part of this. That's a lot of the guitar and the bass is very, it's very staccato like. Um, so they kind of do let the guitars breathe a little bit more in some of the latter mm -hmm. songs, but uh, it, it, it's, this is fantastic. I, I was really, I didn't, I don't, I might've heard pieces of these songs before, um, but I, nothing really jumped out as being like, oh yeah, that's the song. But um, this was just something, the more I listened to it, the more I liked it. And it just, it's so reminiscent. It's another one of those bands that I'm just, there's so many other bands I'm thinking of, but it's almost like a hodgepodge of things. It's yeah. not like, it's definitely this, it's definitely that. It's like, this is the future. Um, as much as any at record that we've heard, um, you know, and uh, it's just it's really well done. So I was I'm a big fan of this album. Well, and then even something like Day of the Lords is like a pixie, you know, that like heavy, like, yeah. duh, 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 you know, that that yeah. dirge like guitar drop that like you hear like create itself, like I said, in like the Pixies or Nirvana, yes. but also like Echo and the Bunny Men yeah, like have that yes, sound yes, yeah, and, and they do yeah. they all do it. The, the thing, right? But they do it in their own ways. But to some degree, it's all a callback to Joy Division. It really and it's is, kind of, yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's really, as, as you said, Matt, as you're listening to this album, you're like, holy shit, this is, this is 80s indie rock all over the place. Like, every bit and piece of it, like, resurfaces. And, and once again, like many of the great albums we've talked about, it's also callbacks to stuff that came before. You know, mm -hmm. whether, like you said, 50s, 60s rock, um, the, the German rock and, and yeah, parts yeah. of that, um, the, the elements of what punk was, and, and that was there, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, also, The Doors, by yes, the way. I yeah. heard Jim, I heard Jim yeah. Morrison. And Ian Curtis was a big delivery. Jim Morrison guy, yeah. both stylistically and also That's so funny. Live Fast, Die Young. Yeah. Oh no, yeah. for sure. Yeah, that's totally true. Yeah, yeah on, absolutely. On yeah. Day of the Lords, especially, which is the second track, I noted that he sounds like Jim Morrison, <laughs> yeah. and that was intentional, yeah. by the way, because yeah. that was a kind of a hero for him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I definitely i I don't want to feel like I'm down on this album because I did like it. It was just kind of different, and I I didn't make the connection to the '80s stuff in the way that you guys did. I just I, I don't know. I just kind of zoomed zoomed in and focused in on kind of the lyrics and the feel of it more as is what it's, I was taking away from it. Yeah. yeah, and I would agree. Like, I think when I first listened to this, the first one or two times, I was like, geez. Like, I had a similar reaction to what you were saying, Josh. And this is just bleak. It's just very... Mm -hmm. But um, once I got kind of past that and I just really started listening to the music itself and I, I just, yeah, I just, it really, I, I really... Um, really felt this record. And I, and it's also kind of just reminded me that like, I kind of do like, you know, um, music that's a little bit, that's either sad or morose or like melancholy or, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, like the minor key stuff that the heavier stuff like that, yeah. it's just, it's, it, it's, it's so much more interesting to me. I don't want to say like it resonates with me cause it's not like, I don't feel, I'm certainly not a depressing person. And actually my wife is like, why do you like this depressing music? You're such a <laughs> happy guy. Like, and I'm like, I don't know. It's just, it's like, it's the yin and the yang kind of a thing. But mm -hmm. this, this type of music is definitely gonna, I don't know. I, I'm going to gravitate more towards this than the, even though I love the poppy stuff, but there's something about this that that I find a little bit more interesting and um, edgy. And uh, this was this had it all over the place. This was just great from start to finish. Yeah, it's um, Josh. I would strongly recommend that after we do the '80s, you go back and listen to this mm -hmm. again. And yeah. I'm curious to see once you get exposed to like stuff that might be new to your palate. And I'm not going to sit here and claim Matt and I are like genius experts, but I think. Maybe the fact that Matt and I might have a little bit more grounding in some of the '80s stuff, you yeah. know, maybe from being a little older or stuff like that, I be will be curious once you hear 
the wide range of the 80s to go back and hear this and see what your thoughts are. Mm-hmm. But it's hard. Yeah, it is a vibe, as we've said. And yeah. the vibe is intense. And like Matt said, you kind of have to listen to it once or twice to clean your palate a little bit. But I'm like you, Matt. I, I don't connect to certain types of sad songs, right, that are a little bit more trite. I, I kind of go more into sad songs that are about the human condition or existential stuff than I do about like individual relationships or personal narratives, you know, Mm. stuff. And I'm not saying I can't connect there, you know, but I, there's something about that existential when people write about the dark or the, um, you know, the uneasy or the uncomfortable or the fear, you know, that it does, there's a, there's a profoundness to it that, um, if you're in the right headspace in particular, it can be almost like um, affirming in a weird way. I would say. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah I, mm-hmm. I know exactly what you're saying. I, I yeah. agree. It's just, it's, it's, there's something about it that just, it adds such a different layer to, it's a different way of listening to music, I think sometimes. And it just, I think in some ways it's, it's, it can be more satisfying um, or at least it's nice to mix it up. Right. It's, it's nice yeah. to kind of have this along with other stuff. It's not like the only thing I want to listen to, but. And this um, is a good example, Matt, where you, while the lyrics certainly were helpful as a thing, I don't even think you needed the lyrics, Matt, because like basically the <laughs> lyrics were right. scoring the sound to yeah. some degree. And like, you didn't need the lyrics to know the general idea of sonically what it sounds like. Whereas like Neil Young, the album we covered earlier, there's differences at times. And it's like, okay, the lyrics can inform parts of this that might slip by on this one. I don't know. You know, I don't know yeah, it's, it's what you miss from thing. not knowing the specifics. Yeah. It's all a uh, amalgamation. Well, it's of, not like the Smiths, right? Yeah. Like the Morrissey's doing depressing lyrics, but it's all under this, like, you know, well, and there's joy division then in them. Yeah. yeah. Certainly yeah. a little bit of how Johnny Marr plays has, uh, I mean, it's janglier, but there's but elements of but how it's he more plays. Pop, yeah. But it's more poppy. It's much more yeah. commercial friendly, if you will, you know, happier sounding melodically and musically. And then you listen to lyrics and you're like, wow, that's kind of messed. <laughs> well, their, their influences yeah. are much more traditionally Western, whereas this, like I said, pulls a little bit from, and, and, and it's much more, um, this is much more electronic as well in yeah. the sense it's synthetic at times. And then of course they follow that, to an even more end that way with new order um yep. than even this yeah 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 it's it's um well yeah i'll i'll leave it at that i mean it it seems like they 80s bands kind of make it more dancey in a way than this is initially um or, or not all of like them like you said no but, from not like Bauhaus like house and stuff <laughs> they oh, sure. go but like new, new yeah. order and cure and things like but that I would don't say. miss don't be mistaken there's this is, i to me i found plenty of danceable stuff i was about to say i found it pretty yeah. it, that's yeah. why i said it's seductive you know what i yeah. mean because there's elements that if you're not quite paying attention you can get sucked into another narrative and that's Just why i said it's like that slide like, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah 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 that's that was a really good comparison i totally forgot about that but yeah it's like kind of a I, it's I, I'm. It's weird that I, I like this and was drawn in so much to this album that's so depressing at the same time, <laughs> you know. So uh, yeah, yeah. 